Uh, we got interviews, different perspectives in a view. Listen to learn what winners do. Empirical. So I was never used to like taking pictures. Um, I didn't care for them, you know, like just whatever. Uh -huh. um, then Emmanuel Stewart, one day he's like, he's like, hey, um, go take pictures with the guys. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'm going to do it later. And uh, he's like, all right, cool. Next day, hey, do you take pictures with uh -huh. the guys? I was like, no, no, um, Mr. Stewart, I'm going to do it later. Uh -huh. uh, and he's like, he's like, ah, right, yeah, just make sure you do it. Third day, he's uh -huh. like, hey, do you take pictures with the guys? And I was like, no, I'm probably going to do it later. He's like, Daniel, listen. <clears throat> you got to understand something. Uh -huh. A lot of these kids are going to become world champions one day. And this is part of your life story. Uh -huh. And one thing is that you tell stories. Another right. thing is that you show stories. Right. Exactly. You know? He's like, so you should get used to like documenting everything. Yeah. So when right. you were saying about documenting like your, your journey, I right. think it's super freaking important. It is. You know, it's, it's super important, important because like um, a lot of people, they, they don't have the understanding and, and they, they, they don't, they, they, you know, maybe they're not used to it uh -huh. or they don't care for it, whatever it might be. But they're understand like at some point yeah. they're going to look back and they want to have like a little bit of like, like, hey, this is what I was doing. Right. You know, this is right. what I, I I did when I was younger. You know, whether you want to teach your kids or, or, or your grandkids uh -huh. or whatever, you know, it's so important. That's why when you when you were talking about like document documenting stuff, because uh -huh. obviously you through your um, you capture, you capture moments. Right. You know, from people that it like, and they weren't even probably paying attention for most part. Right. You know, right. and those right. are the best pictures. You know, mm -hmm. and and um, so like you growing up in the Bronx, right? Like, how do how do you uh, your family background? Like, were you guys rich? Were you guys poor? Middle class? You guys had enough, uh, or maybe you didn't have anything and you just couldn't see it. You know, until later on in life. Just a, we were just an average Puerto Rican family trying to survive in New York. Eating fluff, marshmallow sandwiches, and sometimes eating a good plate of spaghetti and meatballs, you know, from the can. Or my mom cooking <clears throat> some rice because rice was always the Puerto Rican remedy. With rice, you can do anything, <laughs> you yeah. know? yeah. But I was always fed by my parents, you know, they, they, uh, they were great parents, you know, like any other, you know, Latin family, we had our ups and downs and stuff happens and what yeah. have you. And there's some, you know, there's some, there's some dark moments in my life that I went through and passed through and went through the average things of running away from home and stuff like that. Kids have problems and I admit I had problems and what have you, but, you know, I wind up turning into family, you know, I had cousins and people that related to me, I would stay with them and it'd be a lot more gun mind, you know, things would be a lot different and what have you, but... And the, the Bronx was pretty tough back there's then. There's certain you know? things you just <clears throat> didn't, you know, I didn't have control of. And yeah. There's, there's not much we can do but try to learn from experiences. So, you know, we had a nice net group of friends and people that, that I ran around with that, um, you know, I, I used to occupy my time to, to just, you know, do things. And there was groups. Yeah, groups of dudes that like to do what's called geeses. They like to go out there and rob. And they had other groups that, you know, they like to just go dancing. That's all they wanted to do was go dancing. But it was funny because that kind of group was different. Instead of, back then there was a lot of gang war going on in New mm -hmm. York, in the Bronx and Manhattan, in Brooklyn and Queens. We had groups like in, in Upper Manhattan, the Ball Buster group. They were trying to fight with a group called Zulu Nation that was all over New York City. They had different chapters and what have you. And the reason why I bring that up because we're right in the middle of a group of kids that didn't roll with the gangs. We were a group of kids that we were dancers. And, and uh, we, we didn't use the words like breakdancing mm -hmm. back in 1980, 81. It was the floor rock. We were floor rock and we were b-boys, you know. And it was basically the, the mathematics of footwork and, 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 and <coughs> doing moves. And, 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 and we were just, we were fresh little kids, man. Yeah. We, we loved to do what we did. And we would take our, 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 our dance in downtown Manhattan. We would take it in the subways. We would do, you know, different different things in the street. 
and that's how that's how they saw us, you know. And what I mean by they is the 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 people in New York, the the, the people that are in in, in the entertainment field yeah. started to recognize uh, even before I came who this group was, and the group wasn't like four people, five people. I mean, we had it was like 20, 40 of us, fifty of us. It was a big group. And there was a lot of dancers to that group in generations. There was b-boys before me that held it down and, and, and did what they did and, and created the path of, of, of the dance. And, um, you know, it was an outlet that I found myself involved in. It was an outlet that helped me heal and, and deal with a lot of things and what have you. <laughs> Dancing was that something that you had in you since you were a little kid, or is something that you develop with the years? Like as you were getting, like you know, let's say getting a little older, and you saw the kids dancing, and then you're like, you know what? Because you, you, I mean, you already know, like um, music and dancing is always part of the Puerto Rican culture, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and you might not be able to dance, you might not be able to sing, but it's still part of that that the, the culture. Um, and um, so is it something that you eventually develop? Is something that you saw your friends doing it and you say, let me try it out. And then you, you got good at it. Well, yeah, you know, 11, 12 years old and you're young and what have you. And it was people around me, you know, um, you know, Ken Rock was a kid that, you know, I, he always uh, pushed me. He, he was like that coach that I needed in the corner. Mm -hmm. And he was always a guy that pushed me to dance and pushed me harder to learn. And every time he went down and he did it, it was it was phenomenal because it was like, how did he do that? And he was a teacher. These kids used to teach. And the thing is, it was so it, they didn't teach everybody. It was just the people around the group. You know, they used to help each other. You know, uh, veterans like Frosty, Frosty Freeze, you know, he was another one. You know, he used to teach me a lot. I learned from young dudes, this dude named Steve and um, Fable. You know, Steve and Fable were the youngest poppers in Manhattan that they've, they've done so much in, 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 in the dance. And, you know, as a little, little young man, I would learn moves from them. You know, Steve, his nickname is Mr. Wiggles. And Mr. Wiggles and Funk Master Fable, which they had a group that was a very, I mean, it was Rocksteady crew, but they had other groups like, you know, before Rocksteady, uh, Rocksteady merged with a Manhattan group called the Young City Boys, which was Kenny and, and the dudes from Manhattan. And I rolled with the Manhattan dudes. So the Bronx Rocksteady would come and they would, group up with us, you know, Crazy Legs will come and everybody will come to Manhattan and the West Side <clears throat> and we all merge together and, and rock together. But again, you know, it's like like Norm Ski and there was just a whole bunch of ski. There was a whole bunch of dudes in the group. There was so many of us. So it's like even in the fight game, there's so many that come out of the woodworks that have so many different styles and what they do and everybody was learning but everybody had the culture we all had the culture it was all about culture absolutely and and, and you know what's crazy like um because i was having a conversation uh, with a good friend of mine and we were talking about um how people try to label themselves right especially when it comes down to fighters um they try to um they lose that, their identity because they feel like oh this is an individual sport and like let's say dancers It's an individual thing, but it's really not, right? Because at the end of the day, yeah, you go out there and display your skills, right? Mm -hmm. But you got a whole community behind you, right? Mm -hmm. you, you depend and rely on the people that surround you to give you the energy, to like give you ideas, you know, to, 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 to bring that creative side of you out, right? And, and create new moves or, or do things like, like challenge yourself to do more. Um, and, and that's why I would say, like, I don't – because even if a team sport, like, let's say basketball, like, everyone in that team has an individual task, right? You got a point guard. You got a center, right? Everyone has an individual 
task, but they all got to come together to make something happen as a group. Now, uh, when it comes on to fighter, I think the fighter is the product of a community, the, the work of a community, right? So they go out there, they get in the ring, they get in the cage. They, this is the product. This is what a whole community put together, you know, like everyone contributed to that. And, and that's why when you say that, look, how you making reference of other, of other dancers, right? And how they push you. And they, they guided you in a sense, you know, and they inspire you, motivated you to, to, to create your, your own style, to create, you know, your moves and, and things like that. And, and I think that's so freaking key, man. And a lot of people, sometimes they, they don't understand that. Like, you know, every team, like, yeah, you might be a, a, a fighter, but at the end of the day, um, you can't train yourself. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't do those things. Like you need the, the energy from other people as well, uh, you know, to, to, to keep you, let's say to find that those sources of motivation and inspiration and things like that. And, and so you're going through this whole stage in your life. Like, um, this is, uh, uh, how were you like this, the time frame when, when you were dancing and, and things like that. And again, the early eighties. And like I said, you know, it's <clears throat> funny thing that it, as crazy as it sounds, I remember 83, 84, that's when, the rocket really went up and it started to explode. That's like the fighter getting to a place where, guess what? You get the phone call. Now you got the bigger fight. Yep. Now the bigger card. Now the bigger, you know, everybody's really going to see who you are and what have you. And when that period and that time came, the one thing I could truly remember is this. It all boils down to substance. And what I mean by substance is as a New York kid, as a dancer, I still have to take these papers I had to take these contracts and I had to realize the facts. Hear the facts. I'm still a minor. Mm -hmm. I'm still young. So I had to take these to my mom. And my mom had to approve. My mother had to approve. Okay, I'm going to let you go to Japan. Okay, okay. I'm going to let you go to Africa. And she signed. She's the one that had to sign the permission for me to get visas, for me to move forward and, and accomplish this dream at that yeah. time. It, it all boiled down to the respect of my parents. You know, she was the one that made the decisions. She could have easily said no yeah. and not let me go. Yeah. And I wouldn't have went. But she, um, she supported I, it. I thank her for it. Because yeah. at the time, I found something that I found a love in. Yeah. And I was so good at it. And keep you out of trouble. And it was keeping me out of trouble. You know, it kept me, excuse me, away from the corner. Yeah. You know, so to speak. And mom gave me that opportunity. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Bro, and, and how, how does that, how does that feel? Like you, a, a kid in the Bronx, right? You're accustomed to the city. The Bronx was a lot different. It was rough, tough back in those days. And uh, it, it, the 80s is such a, a, a an important um, era for um, for a lot of things like fashion, music, uh, dancing, everything. You know, there's a lot of changes, a lot of colors, right? Uh, and, and and things like that. And uh, so now here you are from the Bronx, and you're going out to Japan, you're going out to Africa and stuff like that. Like how like how was that to you, for you? Like just, it was it shocking. Just, like it was like oh, it wow. Was, like, um, it was like a, honestly like a dream, a yeah. dream because. You know, I've seen sides of the world I never thought at a young age I could ever experience and yeah. see. And, uh, you know, I, I got into the, the entertainment end of it very early in life. And at that young age, when I was young, it was like, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like, you know, oh, you're sitting back and you, you, you're just on vacation and join Tokyo. No, yeah. it was work. It was work. We actually filmed the movie in Japan at, at, at our tour. We were out there and we filmed the movie. And that movie, I mean, there was days. It was 12, 13 hours of b-boying. Like, wow. cut, do it again. Cut, do it again. It was hard work. It was physical and mentally And here's something. Man. You know, <clears throat> when I talk to Crazy Legs, yeah. which is the president of the Rock Study Crew, we were talking some months back, and me and him was laughing because I was talking about that time in, in, in Japan. And um, the funny thing that we talked about, and me and Legs talked about this, 
is when the torch was passed in Rocksteady Crew to Crazy Legs, it was passed by the founder, um, the founders of Rocksteady Crew, uh, Jimmy D, uh, Kippy, Jojo, the old, old, the, the originators from Rocksteady. Um, Jimmy D was in the Navy, and um, I was performing in a club in Tokyo, Japan. And it was this dude in the Navy uniform that went down and he started b-boying. And I looked at him and he started rocking. And I was like, yo, he rocks like crazy legs. It wasn't crazy legs, it was Jimmy D. The founder of Rocksteady, he started going down. Oh, so shit. I battled Jimmy D in the club. Me and Jimmy um, D were... Unbeknownst to you. Huh? I be, unbeknownst to you. Like, you now, didn't even know now, who he was. Now, when I came in, I yeah. never met Jimmy D because yeah. Jimmy broke out to the Navy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and legs took over. And um, I b-boyed against Jimmy D in the club, and we battled each other in Tokyo, Japan. Me and the founder of Rocksteady. And to this day, man, something I always remember, and it's, it's like a part of, again... That torch passed of of something that that I was a part of a culture yeah. that I was a part of an Old Testament of you know when kids you see the generation today and you see the b boys today under the Red Bull market that's doing a lot of so many different things you can talk about power breaking or whatever they want to call it or what have you there's some you know there's a lot of things to agree to disagree with. You yeah. know, for example, they're talking about bringing b-boying or break break dancing. That's the name they they want to bring break dancing into the Olympics. And when they <clears> talked <throat> about that, you know, I talked to a couple of my colleagues and, and, and my pioneer friends, and I was like, "Why is it, you know, why is it that judges from the Olympics are judging break dance competitions, <laughs> and they never went down?" Yeah, because they, they never they, battled. They never battled the New York City Breakers. Yeah. They never battled the Dynamic Rockers, and they never battled the dudes from LA. And they never got down with the real culture of what we do. But they're the ones judging it. Yeah, they're not. So part, you see that yeah, this, they're, they're, that's just me talking yeah, out yeah. because it's like you know that's like saying why are you gonna take boxing out of the olympics that's stupid yeah that's the dumbest thing i've heard of yeah you know yeah. is removing boxing from the olympics yeah. how are you gonna do that and and, and, and uh, listen i agree with you man because like especially people understand like if you're not part of the culture like you never you never experienced that 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 energy right and, and how things are supposed to be like how it feels to be around it like seeing battles and stuff like that like how can you be how can you judge like the people are part of the culture you know and that's what i'm saying like breaking is like is a culture thing you know it's like like hip-hop right and breaking is also part of the hip-hop and there's a lot of history behind it because like if you really understand breaking like people know that puerto ricans were the ones that started with the whole floor thing right like and, and other people were doing the, the, the you know top rock and stuff like that but it's it's um it's like you said man it just it's, it's a culture cultural thing and, oh, yeah. and they don't understand. It. They don't. They don't feel it. They don't. It's not in their DNA. It's not in their. They, they, their skin hasn't touched it. Right? Hasn't felt it. So no, I totally agree with you with that. So how do you go from that? The whole experience uh, as a uh, you know as a as a breaker traveling and stuff like that. How do you go from that to becoming a writer, a boxing writer? It's, it's been a long journey. You know. <clears throat> I mean, like I said. Um, you know, from the dance scene, you know, I came back and, you know, years went by in New York. I got older. And of course, you know, you got to work, you got to pay bills, yeah. you got to take care of yourself. And um, I was very involved in sports with baseball. I used to love big Yankee fan, always going to Yankee Stadium, always following the Yankees and what have you. And uh, I went to Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, my, my grandparents, my grandfather, he uh, introduced me to a man uh, that his son was a ball player in Puerto Rico. And we went to a game in Puerto Rico. He was playing for the Senadores San Juan uh -huh. in Puerto Rico. And I, I met this guy. And he, I mean, I got really close to these dudes, man. And I started talking to them. And I was a big baseball fan back then. So it happens that the guy and his partner, they got drafted into Major League Baseball. And they went into the major leagues. And uh, my grandfather, um, he said that 
that the guy was looking to put a team together to to help him out, you know, in the big leagues. So I took a job with the player, and I wind up working for the baseball player. I wind up, uh, you know, going from city to city, taking them, picking them up at the airport, doing stuff like that, running errands, paying bills for him, just helping them out with a lot of different things, and it, it was a great experience. And through all of that, I was like five years with him. And then he got traded to another team, and I wound up getting another job. I left the, the whole scene with that. But the funny thing about it is, at one time, his wife, she's a very famous singer in Puerto Rico at the time, um, she performed in, in Madison Square Garden in New York. They had a salsa concert mm -hmm. in New York. And um, she performed there, and we went there, and sitting next to us was Tito Trinidad. Hmm. And Tito was telling him, yo, I'm fighting here in the garden. Come to the garden. Watch me fight. So, you know, I was like, okay, all right. You know, so I went with Juan, Juan Gonzalez, Igor Gonzalez. I went with Juan, and we went to the garden. We watched, we watched them fight. And um, from that day on, boxing, I you fell in love with boxing. And I've done everything from uh, working as assistant with the Texas Rangers Baseball Club, working with Ivan Pudge Rodriguez and Juan Gonzalez. Um, from there, I wound up being a beat writer for baseball. I wrote for the Yankees, then I wrote for the Philadelphia Phillies two seasons. And then from there, um, I became a boxing writer. I decided from that point to write in boxing. And my first contact, I remember it was many years ago, my first contact in boxing was a guy named Ed Keenan which he's still in the sports game today, is giving out credentials mm -hmm. in big events and stuff like that. And Ed Keenan got me in with Don King. And I started working for Don King. And I started beat writing for Don King before photography. I was beat writing, you know. So that, that was how the journey started. It started with Trinidad, you wow. know. It, it, is writing something that you always liked or something that you develop with time? Well, it, it was something that I always liked doing it. I used to have diaries like crazy. I used to always love to write. Oh, damn, all right. And, um, you know, it's just something I love doing, you know. And, uh, you know, just, just through the years of, of, of that's when I started to educate myself. Even in baseball, it's like for you to sit nine innings <laughs> in an entire game and it's 95 degrees in Philadelphia on an artificial turf and it's hot. And cover a game all day, you know, you gotta be committed. But Absolutely. you know, I love the sport of baseball, but I really found the love in boxing. And that's when I made that transition. And let me tell you, I learned a lot about boxing. I learned a lot about Don King himself. Man, you hear so many reports about Don King, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's all I can say. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly. But I'll tell you this much as a person. Me, Damon Gonzalez, as a person, Don King always treated me with respect. He always cared about me. He always looked out for me. He always credentialed me. He always allowed me to go in a room and talk to Mike Tyson. He always allowed me to go in a room and talk to Holyfield. You know, there was great things that came upon with this opportunity. And, and uh, I, mad, I have mad respect for Don for that. Big respect, man. Yeah. And, and and that's that's what it comes down to, a matter of perspective. And like like, you know, that's why I'm like slow in judging other people. Because you, if you don't know them personally and you're gonna go off of like what someone else is telling you, that's the easy road, you know, and it shouldn't be like that because uh especially if you don't know the other person, uh you shouldn't be so quick to pass judgment, right? Yeah. Um and, and, and like from your life experience and you knowing him personally you know, you're, you're, you're witness of him being good to you and, and being a good person to you and taking care of you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, I've never met him, so there's really not much I can say about him. All I can do is just read whatever people put out there. And, and obviously, I got to formulate my own, my own opinion, but I'd rather not because I don't know him like that, right. you know? So it, that would be me passing judgment on him right. uh, without knowing him. Uh, but it's good to hear from you because, yeah, I mean, it's it, it gets nasty out there, too. You know, it's kind of like politics and everything else. Like, people are just going to put things out there to make it look bad at times. 
you know, uh, they just they envy the jealousy and things like that. And then maybe they talk crap about Don and, you know, and, but you know him personally and you can say good things. It's kind of like Steinbrenner. Um, like I actually met a couple of people throughout the years mm -hmm. that their parents used to work for Steinbrenner here in Florida, like in, because they have different properties. And, and, and one thing that a lot of people don't know, like he put a lot of kids through college, mm -hmm. you know, and I met a couple right. people throughout the years that they told me like, yeah, my parents used to work for him. So what he would do, everyone that worked for him that had kids, he would put their kids through college. He's like, I went to college because of him, you know, and that's something that a lot of people don't, don't people know about, know that. you know, yeah. um, <clears throat> that's awesome. Dude. So I'm, I mean. I'm I'm pretty sure you met a, a whole bunch of big names in the boxing world, uh, you know, throughout the years, capturing moments. I would say part of being involved in fights throughout the years, Arturo Gotti was a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. Uh -huh. And his team, Pat Lynch and all the guys, Gus and everybody revolved, Buddy McGurr, everybody revolved around Arturo. You know, Turo, honestly, one-on-one -on -one sitting down, Turo would hear my criticism. I would tell him what I would think uh, as a writer. Mm -hmm. And a Turo wouldn't send me to hell and get out and leave the gym and nothing yeah. like that. Yo, he would he would take it like a man, but he would always love me and respect me for what I do and who I am. Because, you know, I would come at it and being myself. I guess I, I don't know if I want to word it as I wasn't one of those writers where I spent a career trying to throw athletes under the bus. Yeah. And and that's what helped me out because I will always try to find a way to find a good thing in, in, in how they performed and what happened in the fight, the good, the bad, the ugly, however it, it would transpire. Then you have other people that will have different approaches. I may not say that's the best approach, mm -hmm. but it's their choice and decision and how they want to brand themselves. People... They get into the fight, it's personal life, and they start talking about this and talking about that. And they start drilling athletes and had nothing at all to do with their fight. Yeah. Nothing at all. Yeah. And it, it kind of, again, it's why in sports writing, it's, it's a tough field. It's, yeah, I've seen guys get cut real quick from it. And, uh, you know, some people do it because they look for that kind of attention. Uh, for themselves more than what they're putting out. Um, and, and, you know, it's just how it is, yeah. you know, in, in, in sports, you know. And how, how do you transition from that um, into uh, your photography part? Well, like, the funny <clears throat> thing about the photography is I met a man through the years, two guys. Mm -hmm. They were photographers. Um, I've actually met them in Florida, but... Um, I've seen them before covering fights with Don King, but I didn't know them. Yeah. But I seen them. One guy's name was Tom Sisson, and the other guy was named Walter Butch Flansburg. They're going Butch. And they were boxing photographers. Yeah. And we're talking about like this is way before, um, you know, mirrorless cameras and the high technology equipment to shoot sports. These guys were shooting with old school cameras and stuff like that. And, and uh, Butch Flansburg was somebody that, uh, you know, I met him here in Florida and he was shooting photography and I was a writer. I remember I worked for FedEx Express and I'm 21 years, thank God, uh, with that company. Um, looking at another seven, then I'm out. Yep. <laughs> you know? So uh, I remember when I transferred from up north here, it was a couple of years after the towers. I came down to Florida and my first week in Florida. I started FedEx Monday, Friday, I was ringside, where was it? The Doubletree in Tampa in West Shore at a boxing event. And the event was held by Ivan Inchereira and Terry Trakis. Terry Trakis had One Punch Productions. Yeah. And Terry welcomed me in. And uh, he, he knew about me as a sports writer from up north and stuff. And I sat ringside uh, in the fights. And that's where I met Butch. He was doing photography at that event. And I became friends with Butch. And, um, you know, I started to admire, you know, what they were doing. Him ringside shooting the photos and yeah. stuff like that. And I always had that curiosity. And I knew photographers from up north, um, uh, Tom Casino, you know, so many great guys that 
have been photographers for years that, um, you know, I, even with boxing writers, you know, there were certain people in the sport that, you know, go under the tree with the most shade. Yeah. And, and that's how I was. I, I would be around people that I know that would, would teach me. You know, and that's how I would learn, man. Hey, I would never try to do it on my own. I would always ask for for help with something or advice, or yeah. and that's how I learned. You know, you be open to it. So, when do you create Light and Box? When I created Light and Box, I think I created it in two thousand and three. Two thousand three is when I created Light and Box. That's when the word I came up with the word Light and Box. So funny because I don't remember the story behind how yeah. I created it. But but, 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 it, but it's interesting because, I mean, you've been with FedEx for so long. And at the same time, you know, you were doing it. it it's, it's, it's a crazy perspective because you were capturing moments through your writing and then you capture moments with your lenses. Right. Right. And 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 it, it's just like it's it's really interesting, um, you know, because obviously one is through the, the um, both are visual, right? Because you got the writing, people are reading, they, they, you know, they're capturing the moment, you know, that you, whatever you presented to, to the audience um, about this, this fighters, and then you, ca you start capturing moments through, through a lens, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and then you work working for FedEx and you're doing all these things. And here we go to time management, yeah. right? Like time management, and I think that's something that um, a lot of people don't want to develop, like because you're you were able to do all these things, and as busy as you were, you still managed to 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 do it all, right? Mm -hmm. And and because it, it even happens with fighters, because a lot of fighters, a lot of times, um, like they they so their time management is so poor that they run into walls. Right, because they're like, oh, I don't have time for this. I don't have time. No, you do have time. You just don't have your priorities right, you know, mm -hmm. in the right place. And uh, uh, so I admire that because, like, that's the, I mean, writing takes time. You know, you got to sit down and write. Like, it's it's not a, a two minute thing. You know, unless you're doing like something very short. Uh, but if you're writing, you kind of like an article type of thing, and you're trying to to convey a message to other people about. A, a, a boxer, you know, it does take time. It does take a little bit of thinking, you know, making sure that you convey the right message, you know, put it, utilizing the right words, stuff like that. And then taking pictures is, an, is another process, you know, like you got to edit the pictures. You got to make sure they look right. You got to pick, you take, you take how many, how many pictures do you take at like average before you select like a, the few that you want to present? I mean, when I started, it was bursting. I was just letting the camera go. And now it's to a point where it's more of a focus on. Yeah. I watch the pivot foot of the fo the fighter, and you, when they move that foot, here comes the punch. That because that, that, now yeah. you know what you're looking for. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, you study the fighters. Yeah, you know, I went from fighting, uh, shooting full body frames of the fighter, and looking at the shots and saying, uh, "Yeah, it's a good shot." Yeah. But until you know, again, people like Butch and. And a dear friend of mine, I remember when I first met him, Don had a fight card in Reading, Pennsylvania. We went to the Sovereign Center uh -huh. in Reading. That was Marshall Kaufman's background. Okay. And Marshall Kaufman actually did the card with Don King. That's when I met Marshall. He had Kermit Centron. That was his fighter yeah. at the time. And um, I remember this guy came in and he started photography. It was his first time ever shooting a boxing event. He has photography experience. He's done other things. But this was his first time ever shooting a boxing. I met him and, you know, Tom Casino was there with some guys there. And he, he talked to me and I talked to him. I met him and it's about networking. Yeah. I was networking and meeting more of the guys involved in the game. And um, it was so funny because that guy that night, Ricardo Mayorga, uh -huh. knocked the fighter <laughs> out. Bah! The guy was knocked out cold in the ring on the floor. And Mayorga went in the press conference. He pulled out a cerveza, a yeah. beer, and he pulled out a cigarette. He started smoking the cigarette in the press conference. You're crazy. Yeah. So the photographer didn't have his equipment. He packed it up. He pulled oh. out his cell phone and he started with his cell phone taking pictures 
a mayor guy smoking the cigarette with the beer in his hand talking. He had nothing for me. This was easy work. And he's talking and he's shooting this with his cell phone. Would you believe it? His photo, one of the photos in his cell phone was in the front cover of Sports Illustrated. Wow. And that's how he got his start. His name is Ed Mahalan. Uh-huh. Ed Mahalan got his start that way. And uh, he shot from that point on, within a year or two, that's when he signed a contract, a big contract. He started working for, for HBO. So he was HBO Boxing's number one guy, photographer. He shot for HBO for all these years. And <laughs> boy, do we miss HBO. <laughs> <laughs> I miss HBO <laughs> Boxing, man. Oh, yeah. It, 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 so it, it, it was with yeah. HBO all these years. And if you remember some years back when HBO went away, he signed now. He's the current photographer for Matchroom for Eddie Hearn. You know, so Ed's with uh, Eddie Hearn now. Dude, so like it, I was just with him. Yeah. We did a fight card in Cleveland and I was ringside shooting with Ed. And it's so humbling because me and Ed shot God in war together and we shot so many fights together. But again, it's it's just um, you know, networking and, and knowing wonderful people that, that they understand why you're there. Yeah. You know, you're there to do a job, you're there to do it the best you can and give a hundred percent no matter yeah. what document and i was there the document it's a very serious thing yeah you know it's a serious thing yeah. because it's a job yeah you know it's not not anybody can can do that kind of work yeah but it's 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 just it's it's great to have you know you go from fedex and then you go shoot a fight and then i go home and then the next weekend i'm jumping on a plane to sanction a boxing fight with my belt so it's like it's for the past two three four years it's been non-stop yeah and uh, in the middle of all this of course you know right in front of everything is my family you know i have my significant other i have my family to take care of and um i will say this that has everything to do with it because right now i'm 53 years old but i'll tell you what my wife is my rock and uh, it took me a lot of years to get to that place where you start to recognize and you start to learn. When you have a partner that's right there to support your dreams and, and, and to walk with you through those dreams, you don't need, you're a champion. No, you don't I'll need do anything it. else in life but somebody there that knows and understands that, yes, they, 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 they're everything and you treat them like they're everything. And at the same time, balancing that out, you got to go to London to shoot, have a safe trip. Yeah. You got to go to LA, have a safe trip. You got to go to New York, have a safe trip. They understand that you have to work, but they also understand that they love and support everything about you. Dude. That, Everything like, that, that gets rid of any type of insecurity, and, and exactly. in, that, in that sense, I'm like so blessed with my family. Um, because obviously, you know, I've been away, let's say, in Thanksgiving, I was in Australia, and my, my wife's birthday, I was in Canada, right? So, I'm like traveling, and sometimes in, I'm in a different state, but my family's been so supportive, man, that gives me peace of mind because I, I want to come back home. Like I want, I look forward to being home. Like I'm not like, oh shit, now I gotta go back in there. Like I gotta deal with all this bullshit. Not at all, man. And and that's it's so true what you're saying, man. Because like you turn into a freaking into Superman, you know, when you got the support and 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 especially your rock, which is your wife. You know, she's like she's very understanding, and at the same time, uh, you know, she's not. She's not competing mm -hmm. with other things. Right. You know, she knows she has her place. She's mm -hmm. always going to be first, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but it, it allows you to develop your, your passion, your vision, right? Uh, and, and not have to worry about like, oh, my God, like I have to go home. I got to deal with this, deal with that. You know, it's always an, uh, uh, some type of a disagreement or argument or debating, you know, and things like that. Yeah. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you a thousand percent in that sense, man. That's that's so freaking key in there. A anyone's passion and anyone's vision, you know? And going back to you, what you were saying about giving a hundred percent every time you do something, you took it serious because you were passionate, but you were also, also uh, 
conscientious of the fact that um, you know you you you're trying to bring someone else's life and and report to a, to an audience, right? Mm -hmm. And you always trying to br sh display and show or showcase their positive attributes and not concentrate on their small negative things, you know, that we all have them, right? We all have flaws and, and things like that. And, um, and that's why like, um, I, th that's, I admire that from you because mm -hmm. like you, you trying to, to utilize someone else's story to motivate and inspire other people instead of trashing them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then creating, uh, uh, creating like this negative vibe out there, mm -hmm. and then uh, people like are like, oh, all they want to say is something negative without even knowing the person and without taking time to actually understand what the hell was truly going on, um, you know. And and uh, but you were passionate and you care. Let me tell you, D, that <clears throat> you brought that up because let me tell you, 2006. Let's mm -hmm. go back a little. It's way before I knew my wife. Now, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What mm -hmm. I talked about earlier. Don't think that life ain't gonna bring you problems. Because oh. life, man, we know that life is a roller coaster. Life can come at you and knock you out and put you on the ground in a second. And I remember 2006 was a tough year for me. It was a tough year because at that time I have two sons up north and I was paying some deep, heavy, heavy child support. <clears throat> and of course, as a dad, I gotta be responsible and pay my child support. No matter how many jobs I may think I would have, or no matter what the circumstances may be, I ran into problems financially. Yeah. It's just the way life happens. And, and I remember at that time, I remember I got thrown out of two apartments, okay, because I couldn't afford to pay the rent. It happens. Things happen. I remember living in my Chevy Cavalier and going to work every day with a smile. I remember living in my Chevy Cavalier and going to the fights and sitting ringside and writing about the fights and posting them and doing all of that, but still living in my car. I didn't give up on my passions. I didn't give up on my job. I didn't give up on myself. And that's the main thing. I didn't give up on myself, man. It was, it was a hard road and, and it got really deep at times. And no matter what, I, I kept on believing and knowing that there's a reason behind all this. And, uh, you know, the best is yet to come. And I, 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 I can honestly say I had enough faith to keep on punching, to keep on working hard, to keep on training, to, to condition myself mentally not to lose it. Not to lose it. There's no other way I can explain that. Yeah. And that's what it took. It took for me to be a, a true man. And no matter how may bad it may have seemed, don't give up. And I didn't give up. And I kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. And of course, you know, things turned around. And they got better. And they got better. And they got better. And they got better. And they haven't stopped getting better since 2006. Man. That's freaking awesome. They have I, 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 I got a question for you. Um, 9 11. Mm. How does that change your life perspective? Like you were out there. And 9 11 were... was hard. <clears throat> 9 11 was hard. Just, uh, at that time, Don was uh, making the fight between. We had uh, April 14th of 2001, we just had the fight in the garden with uh, William Joppy yeah. and, and Tito Trinidad. And uh, we had, after the fight, we had the face-off between Hopkins and Tito. And uh, we were preparing for September to, to have the fight card in the garden. So we had a press conference leading up to the fight. And then a week later, after the press conference, the towers were hit. And at that time, I was working for a paint company and and the paint company had, uh, it's a very well-known paint company. They have five gallon buckets. We went, we tracked the trailers into ground zero and we handed out the buckets to FEMA, the fire department, and it was to help pick up debris of the crime scene of, of, of what was happening down there. So, um, you know, hands on, 
experiencing and seeing all that was was difficult. It was hard for me. It was hard to just just to to see our country, to see our world. Yeah, that it had to come to this, you know. So, uh, you know, that was that was some real tough times. Because I, I was already here in Tampa, and I had just went up north uh, to visit. Came back down. I'm heading to work. Um, I pull up. I, you know, go into the office, and people are talking about like, oh, there's a plane just hit one of the towers. And in my head, I'm like, hold on a second. Planes don't go through Manhattan. So that makes no freaking sense. What the hell is going on here? And uh, and then turn on the news and they're talking about it. In my mind, it right away, it just hit me. I was like, dude, this is not this is not normal. It has to be a, a terrorist uh, attack, right? And, um, and, and then when the second plane hit, it was just like, that's it. You know, and obviously I was down here. Um, like, I can't get in touch with my, my mom, with my sisters. Uh, like the lines were were off, you know, like like everything got cut out. So for for a moment, no one was able to get in touch with anybody up north. And I'm trying to get in touch with them. There's no response. I'm like, all right, well, I just got to, I don't want to get frustrated. I got to relax. Just wait. Let's see what happens later, you know. Eventually got in touch with them uh, hours later. Um, and, and But it was frustrating in the sense that I, like, I, I wanted to do so much more, but I couldn't even buy tickets planes went went down like there was you had no access right, to fly no right yeah. and uh um and, and so it was very frustrating in that sense because i wanted to do it so what i did instead i jumped into the the red cross and started to volunteer for them for the disaster um action team um you know and and um they, they you know we were doing other things here but but uh i was like man I, I have to jump on something and help out you know since i can't make it out there um but it was it it, it it was interesting because I was down here and obviously it, it, people were in shock because of what happened. But for me, coming from up north and my family being up there, it was a different feeling. You know, it was a very different feeling. It was like it hard to explain. Um, inside, it was just like everything was just turning, you know. Um, it was crazy. But obviously you being out there, you had a different visual. You know, I was I, the only visuals that I have is like the images from TV. You know, you were out there like smelling the air. You know, mm -hmm. something a, a lot different. And uh, and and I'm pretty sure just like like COVID. You know, those are like uh, things that change your life perspective. You know, how you view life and how you do things. And it's crazy because like even though you were going through things in your own personal life, you know, you're out there still trying to help out as much as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's 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 pretty interesting, man. Like, I mean, have you been back? Like after? Yeah, I, I've been back and back to you know that again. You know, three and a half weeks later, we wind up having the fight card in, yeah. in Manhattan at the Garden, and everything resumed. Uh, I went with a singer to Shea Stadium, and he performed the national anthem in Shea Stadium. Mark Anthony, he performed the national anthem over there. And uh, it was resuming baseball, and uh, then we had the the upset in the yeah. Garden of of Hopkins beating Felix Trinidad, which was uh, for Poliquas it was hard for us. Yeah, of course, it was very very difficult for us to see our 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 trainers a legend, our, our you know, yeah. legend, you yeah. know, get beat like that. But you know, uh, to have you know the normal sense of life come back. It, it, it was a sense of pride, you yeah. know. It was very emotional in the garden that night. Very emotional in the garden, um, and that that I do remember. Wow, uh, that's insane. But I'm sure all those experiences. Obviously, man, you, your background is just so crazy, so so diverse in the sense, you know, like being part of like this culture, this dancing culture, this part of like like a bigger culture, right? Uh, and and then at the same time, you're going into writing. And and and, and uh, presenting a story in writing, then presenting a story through your pictures, you know. Then you experience nine eleven out there. Um, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't. I was down here, so I can kind of like let's say live it, right? Um, and in two thousand nineteen, Florida Hall of Fame. Yeah, Florida Boxing Hall of Fame. You know, when they they gave me the call and. The president of the Hall of Fame was the photographer 
um, that I mentioned earlier, yeah. Walter Butch Flansburg, he founded the Hall of Fame in 2009, and he built the Hall of Fame every year, him and his wife, Kathy Flansburg, with, with a great team of people. And, uh, you know, years later, I got honored to, to be inducted in the Hall in Florida for, you know, my contribution towards towards boxing, you know, and, and being a part of the sport and what have you. And I was sincerely humbled by it, you know, sincerely humbled. You but well-deserved, though. You know, I, well I, deserved. you know, I work hard. Yeah. And, and, and that, that has everything everything to do with it, you know, is putting hard work. And, you know, also what comes with that is the lessons. And what I mean by lessons is I got two sons that live in Pennsylvania. And the minute they call me and they're like, oh, well, dad, oh, you know, my job or, you know, they got something going on. I said, wait, look, look at your father. I do this, I do this, and I do this. What's going on? You know? You know, when it comes to putting things in this perspective, it's a matter of education. And, um, you know, that's, that's so important. It's so important. If I, can't, if I can't give the example, you know, for them to lead, you know, um, then what kind of father am I being? You know? Yes. So I have to lead with example. So there's no excuses. There's no excuses <clears throat> that, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. You can do whatever you want in life. You know, so you know? especially when they have more resources than what we had per se. You know well, what I mean, you know, in in, in a sense, in a sense, yeah. And back to the World Trade Center, it was only three, four years ago. That's when I went back down there. Three, four years ago, I haven't been down there since nine eleven. I've been back and forth to New York yeah. working boxing fights, but I would stay away from. From, from the, zero? The, yeah, I wouldn't go near there. Yeah. I wouldn't even think about going down there. Brings it for now. And Sentiments, a couple of years yeah. ago, I met both my sons at the, the, the bus station. They met me in Manhattan. And I took them down there, and I did a photo shoot down there. And I'll tell you, that was an emotional day for me. It was an emotional day, but also a proud day when I saw that big tower. Yeah. And I shot photos of it, it just the, the feelings I was having seeing that. You know, yeah. watching us recover from, from that was incredible. And then going in the museum was pretty pretty intense. And and, and then how do you how do you go how do you go to like this this whole um, NBA thing now with this, this new uh, boxing organization that, that you know that you leading? Four or five years ago, um, I was uh, elected as president of the National Boxing Association, which is a sanctioning body belt in professional boxing. Uh, we have the WBC, the IBF, the WBA, uh, the WBO, Paco, um, and what have you. The former president was Walter Bush Flansburg, and the history of the NBA is very ancient. And what I mean by ancient, it just has a great history. Since 1923, uh, the NBA boxing has been there. And um, through the years, the NBA, Walter Butch Flansburg had it. And later in life, he just hasn't, wasn't feeling well. And he couldn't, uh, you know, do any fights and sanction fights. And, and uh, a transition had to happen. So, uh, you know, I, I stepped in and I started to, to recognize some things. I started to rewrite the whole concept and how we would look at the business and how would we be effective in the sport of boxing? So here's one thing I would say. Through the years, I've developed a friendship with uh, most of the presidents of the belts in the, in, in the sport. That really, honestly, was my road that helped me personally um, be successful with the NBA. And the reason why is that because it was about opening communication. It was about sitting down with all the other presidents and saying, hey, look, here are my champions. You know, they want to succeed and do something more. You know, this is the first step to see if they could behave like a champion. If they can get a belt, defend the belt and, and do things in the community and get involved and what have you. And represent the sport of boxing correctly the way any male or female should represent the sport Absolutely. of boxing. Yes. So if there's something I learned from the bigger belts, I learned from from what they do, you know, this is something that can be done. 
So, um, you know, I pretty much got involved in doing it. And, uh, you know, I decided, well, I'm not going to sanction the fight wearing flip-flops and shorts. Yes. You know, and a tank top. Yes. You know, I would go in a suit and a tie. And as an executive president of the organization, I would represent the organization. I would do what I can to to work with the promoters and the fighters to, to sanction fights appropriately the best I can. And, uh, you know, see what we got. Yes. And uh, pretty much with that, it built the organization back up to a sense that right now, the sport of boxing knows who the National Boxing Association is. And they understand that, you know, um, look, believe it or not, but the bigger belts are looking. They're looking. They, they want to get involved with people that, that, that are taking their career of, of, of boxing serious. You know, they want to get involved with people that understand the importance of being a champion, you know. And, uh, you know, there's some people that we learn throughout the line, they'll, they'll, they'll fight for a belt and then becomes, you know, use the word trophy. Yes. Yeah, they just want a trophy. They just want it in their showcase. You know, they just want it to say, okay, I accomplished this. You know, and that's, you know what, that's okay. And that's okay because at that time, at that moment, you deserve that. You definitely deserve that opportunity. And I'm not going to say you didn't, you know, because I'm the one that sanctioned it. So, of course, you deserve yes. it. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, again, we, we have bylaws that we go by that we try to implement across the board with fighters. So, if a fighter isn't doing what they need to do with us, how are they going to do what they need to do with the bigger bodies? Absolutely. It's just not yes. going to work that way. Yes. You know, um, there's going to be a lack of interest on the upper end with somebody that's not um, motivated. Yeah. You know, you have to be motivated. So, you know, just like anything else in life. So I've met a lot more people uh, being involved with the NBA, uh, traveling the country, doing fights and what have you. And it's so great to have alumni that, that have won the belt that really have taken charge. Yeah. And I want to use the word tra- taking charge of stepping next to me and say, let's go. Let's get this thing going. Let's start working on stuff. Let's start doing stuff. You know, one of my mentors and dear friends, Roy Jones Jr., who defended the NBA belt, who was proud to wear the NBA belt, always showing an example, always uh, sticking up for us, always uh, speaking good about us because you know what? It means something. It meant something to him then. It means something to him now. That says everything. And he's definitely a Hall of Famer. And, and uh, we love him. And, and, and you, you know what's so interesting that you say that? Because like, I feel like a lot of times certain fighters, um, some fighters, they go into this mindset that, oh, this is a, let's just say, right, in MMA or boxing, oh, this is a, uh, a local promotion. This is a regional promotion. This is this. And I'm like, Listen, you got to take pride in those things. And I'm talking about healthy pride. Like, you got to be invested in that. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, 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 it, that is your reward for doing things right, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so now that you're wearing it, you have to be invested. Like, because that's the only way. That's how you're going to um, uh, feel and, and attract that energy that you need to move on to the next level, then to the next level. And a lot of times, you know, like a lot of people is like, oh, they like they, they, you know, they patronize. Like, you know, like, oh, this, this, this is not important. I'm like, no, you should be like have the healthy pride and healthy ego of like whatever community you belong to, to go out there and, 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 and represent it well. You know, like, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like when I'm looking at my display case with all this thing, those things that I have, I take pride in that because those are like moments throughout my journey, you know? So I'm proud of it because it might not mean a lot to other people, but to me, from where I come from, from like how much work had to be put into it, how much sacrificing and things like that is huge. You know, most people don't quit halfway there, you know, a quarter of the way there. And, uh, um, and, and, and it's great to hear someone like Roy Jones, who's freaking a, a legend, you know, uh, to, to be proud of that, you know, be proud of that accomplishment because it is an accomplishment, you know, it means something and it should mean something to anyone that earns that belt, 
you know, or to burn or, or, or earn any type of belt, um, you know, and be invested in it. And, and as they do it, they attract a good positive energy that is going to propel them to the next thing, whatever achievement that might be, you know, with a different promotion, whatever, whatever it is that they're trying to do in life, you know. And I think that's what a lot of people lack a lot of times. They, they don't take pride in those things. You know, they 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 minimize the, the importance of it uh, because they looking at something. Oh, this right here, you know, is what means a lot. I'm like, no, everything here means a lot. You know, every step, every every step that you take, that you that, that you climb up, you know, it has a, a meaning, you know, and you should be invested in that. Um, so it's it's great to hear that from Roy Jones because it, it tells a lot about his character, you know, as a, as a human being, as a person, and that he understands boxing and being a professional athlete, you know, uh, it, it's, that's such a like uh, higher IQ when it comes down to uh, social intelligence, you know, and understanding those things because, like you said, this with networking, um, getting to know other people, creating friendships, building bridges. You know, those are the things that are, are going to help you uh, become an apprentice, you know, because you go in there with that mindset of being an apprentice and trying to learn from other people. Even in, in your writing, you're trying to learn about the fighter. You know, you're not just like making things up. You're trying to like have a conversation with them. You're trying to see their mannerism, you know, their behavior. And then based on that, that's how you write. You know, the, when, when you capture moments through your lens, like, like you said, it's easy to just do a, a, a full body uh, shot, right? But it's, it's different when you're trying to capture the spirit, whether it's on, on, the, on, the, on the pivoting, on the knee, on the movement, on the face, you know, it's a lot different. And, and that says a lot about you as well. Um, when one, one, what can you share of, as far as like all these high level boxers and champions? something that you've seen about them, right? Something that might be similar, like maybe their attitude, their compassion. Because, yeah, there, there's a lot of people get it confused. They see the savages going in the, in the ring, going, in, going in, in, in the cage. But outside of that, people that make it very far, they tend to be very humble and compassionate, you know? Uh, and, and obviously, you have the ones that they're not, you know? But what's something that you that you've seen throughout the years that they probably share, like like the Tito Trinidad's and 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 the Arturo God Gaddis, you know, rest in peace, and and all those people that you've seen throughout the years. There's something that you've seen that they're like, oh man, you know, like I saw this in that person, in that person, in that person. One fighter that um, he was always great with interviews, and um, I always admired what he's accomplished in boxing. Mm -hmm. I don't fall into these patterns of generations where fighters start to right away compare fighters to Mayweather or Jake Paul or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And uh, he's a fighter that it was that era of time where it's no different than now and it was no different then whereas you're fighting, you train in a hard gym, you work very hard, but it doesn't change the fact of the reality that there are people that don't want nothing to do with you. They just don't want to get in the ring with you. Nobody wants to fight. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, that's just how it is in sports. Um, when this fighter was younger, he's fought a couple of times. He fought in the Sun Dome a few times. And I remember him fighting there and wrote about his fights there and what have you. And he decided he got a team together and he got sponsors together and they were able to come up with some money. He decided to continue to stay in his winning ways. Stay focused, train, fight. Stay focused, train, fight. So he decided to spend some years fighting in Germany, fighting overseas. And that's what the investment he did to continue to get wins. Now, remember, over there, he wasn't fighting donuts. Mm -hmm. He was fighting guys that were undefeated. He was fighting guys that were tough over there. And he was building himself. This is the same guy that went in the ring with Jermaine Taylor. This is the same guy that beat Tito Trinidad. And we're talking about Ronald Winky Wright. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, Winky is a guy that is a dear friend, but he's a true champion, you know, and, and, and he's a guy that really dedicated himself to understand the importance when him and Dan Birmingham got together in the gym and it was time to work. It was time to work, you know, and the results came out through the wins. And yes, he had his moments and he had his career. He had a great career. And uh, he's a well-respected person to me um, because he never gave up. Yep. He never gave up. And, um, you know, it's tough, man. You know, it's tough. You know, we're in generations where, you know, there's people that, you know, they, they really dedicate themselves to the sport. And they love the sport, same like they love MMA. And it's all about the individual. It's all about what you put your heart into, you know? So yeah, it's 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 um and and I think uh, uh, being a fighter, um, like obviously you're already um, you're already wired differently, you know, because this is not something that people say like oh, I want to go in there and get punched in the face or get kicked or you know things like that. Um, so you're already wired different. You're already a different type of individual. Um, but um, it, sometimes I I, I think. Uh, m many of them, because I've seen them, I've seen it too. Especially coming up through the amateurs, they either get burnt out or they 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 really don't have the will to continue doing it. You know, they become either lazy, they get influenced by the negativity around them and things like that. So they get attracted to, to go in a different path, right? Uh, Winky, like, let me tell you, man, like I really respect him a lot. Uh, he was one of those fighters, uh, never created any type type of bullshit out there um the, the dude obviously uh um people criticize him because people wanted to see like like all these crazy things but winky was like his defense was so good his counters he was like very intelligent yeah. you know but he's a smart dude because now when i hear about him like i was sure that he's out there doing doing well you know that he's got his businesses and and, and they got things moving so he's one of the smart guys like he's a heck of a golf player too oh, oh man you see <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and, um, and, and, and that's one thing that he was like really focused when he came down to his fighting, you know, he didn't play, um, like, like I saw, like you would see, you, you, you went to five factor when, when Miguel Cotto was here in Tampa mm -hmm. and Miguel would come in, no one would tell him anything. And the dude would just start warming up. He would have a, a clock and we put it, set it for like 20 minutes and just start jumping ropes, stretching, doing his own thing without anyone telling him, like he was like extremely focused. You know, but he was a little bit of a of a goofball as well. You know, people didn't see that. But when it was came down to training, he was serious. You know, he was just like coming in. He would say hi to the people that he, he needed to say hi to, and then he would just go to work. You know, there was no no BSing. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 uh, and obviously, you know, like in in the Mayorgas and, and stuff like that. That's like one in a million. They only get so far, and then after that, you know, obviously, they're not going to get to the very top, you know. They'll, they'll make a name for themselves because they're just different, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, dude, it's it's incredible. And and that's why it's hard for me to judge fighters because, I like, from my experience and from what I see, all, all the guys that, 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 that I've trained and, and stuff like that, they go through a lot of things in their personal life, you know, and they have to continue. It's always like an uphill battle. You know, so it's hard for me to judge other people because um, I want to assume that they're going through things too, you know. So just to make it to weigh-ins and then to make that walk into the ring or into the cage, uh, they had to go through a lot of things, mo most of them. You know, some are just lazy and they don't care about the, what they do, you know. They're just there for a paycheck. But uh, in the ma majority, a lot of these kids, you know, they train their asses off. They freaking sacrifice a lot of things um, and things are going to come up at the last minute, you know, injuries or little, my shoulders sore, my knee, something, you know, and they still manage to make the walk. So it takes a lot, you know, people just see the night of the fight and, and they're like, they want to judge fighters based on that. Uh, you know, they want to coach fighters from like through a TV or whatever, you know. And, and I'm like, I'm like, I, I couldn't do that. You know, I respect them. Do I, do I have some observations from maybe from a coaching perspective? I might, I might 
like just little things, you know. But if anything, I'm always trying to learn. Like when I'm watching people, I'm like, oh wow, like I like what he did there. I, I like how he responded. I like how he said that move. Uh, uh, how he uh, set it up, you know. How he set up his counter or his uh, his attack, you know, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So I'm always like trying to to be an apprentice um, and and constantly learning, you know, from others. Um, so I, I always. I'm happy to see other people succeed. I'm happy to see other people do well. I'm happy happy to always see other people do the right things, you know, even when it's tough, you know, because mm -hmm. I know uh, at, at, at times, and this is not something that I share with other people and, and discuss, but, you know, uh, there's been times where I had $10 and I saw someone out there needing something to eat and I just gave those $10 to go grab the person something to eat. And I stayed with that, but I, I was fine, you know, because yeah. I've been through other things in life where it was worse. So, but I know what that's it going, and like, I, I, I will figure it out. You know, I was in a better, regardless, even if those were my last $10, I was in a better situation than the other person, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and, and maybe my life experience has uh, molded me to feel or see, see things a certain way. You know, like just like your uh, your life and your life perspective, you know, just like when you talk about your kids and you the best thing that we can do is lead by example, you know, and that because words. Yeah, we can share a lot of words, but a lot of times it goes to one ear, goes out the other one because that's, uh, we've done it, too, when we were younger, you know, and, and with life, it, it teaches us, mm -hmm. you know, like we go through certain experiences. I've slept on benches and chairs and, and things like that you know i had moments where i had to sleep in my my little car and stuff like that you know and and, and it teaches you something and to to be able to overcome and understand that life is life it has it's going to have highs it's going to have downs you know and what is it that you're going to do about that you know are you going to start moping and and crying about it or and complaining about it or are you actually going to do something about it you know, and that's it. That's what I think it makes a big difference. A lot of these boxers, especially in boxing, they come from nothing. Yeah. You know, a lot of these guys come from nothing. We all do from yeah. nothing. Most of us. And, yeah, and 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 to make a name for themselves, to like be able to like make it so far, like you know, they change their families' lives. You know, they change their communities' uh, 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 life. You know, they able to come and and, and contribute to them. And contribute to that you know to to better men uh and that's why i think it's so important that people stay focused and they try to achieve whatever they can because you know fighters just like dancing it's only going to be this much in your life you know as a human being is this much oh yeah so you got it you got to be able to do this give a hundred percent to that because you're only going to do it for so long after that your knees hurt everything hurts you know um and but then you got to continue being a good human being and, 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 and utilize your platform to do good for other people as well, you know, because this is bigger than fighting, man. This is bigger okay. than anything, you know, to, to be able to, to, to have, uh, uh, for, in, in, in my case, for example, to have a black fighter, um, and, and, and I'm going to use this. I don't like using these terms, but, but I'm going to use it for, for, so people can understand it. But to have a black fighter, to go out there and fight, and to see all kinds of kids, White kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, all kinds of kids wearing the fighters t-shirt. You know, think about that. That would that would have not happened years ago. You know, so and and they have to understand that, dude. Like now, you are a role model. Now you are an inspiration, a, a motivating factor. You know, to other kids are watching you. Mm -hmm. You know, so utilize the platform to do good. Oh, you yeah. know. And, and not only that, you can be a white fighter as well, you know, and and motivate all the people, all their kids from different backgrounds. You know? And they're going to reach out to you. And that's why you should always like stop, take your time, take a picture. If they ask you for an autograph, give them an autograph. Don't rush, you know, like we got to be thankful. We got to be grateful. I think Michael Jordan used to say that every time he played, he played thinking that there was a kid watching him. You know, and then he wanted to inspire that kid. And, and I was like, I was like, wow, that's that's really deep, you know, when it comes down to it. And and I think the best thing that we can do is obviously lead by example. You know, I watch you 
and I watch you and I see all the things that you do and that's very inspirational, you know, because it's not easy. I know how, how consuming it is. You know, we hear it talking, but it takes a little bit of time before and it takes a little bit of time afterwards to break everything down, to put everything back in place, do this, do that, you know. So it's not just a, a like from this time to this time. You know what I mean? It's, it's like it, it, it requires time for mm -hmm. everything that we do. You, even you going out there to a boxing match and whether you're going to write or you're going to take photos or uh, or you're going to sanction the, 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 the events and, and things like that. It takes time because you got to get ready at home. If you're working, you have to go home, shower, change, you know, drive to whatever you got to drive to or you got to fly to whatever you got to fly to. You know, it takes a lot of time. You know, it's not just a, a straight shot. And it's like from this time to this time and that's it. You know, no, it takes a lot. And you got to learn how to manage your time. And things a like couple that. of years ago, D, when COVID-19 <clears throat> hit, was like, oh, my God, what yeah. are we all going to do? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can't go to fights, can't do this, can't do that. That's when I, I decided to, for the fun of it, to have a, a podcast. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and, and I watch it. And when I did that podcast, you know, just listening to everybody's story, because everybody has a story. And it wasn't just boxers, it was trainers, it was amateur fighters. It was, uh, it was incredible, mm -hmm. because everybody had a story. And it was so educational, not just for the audience, but for me, you know, and it was great listening, you know, to individuals, guys and girls and people come on the show and share their experiences and their life experiences and what bring them to the sport and this and that. And it was just great listening to all that. You take something in a generation where the only thing important is like, so who are you fighting next? Um... You want to call anybody out? No, we're not into that. We're not doing this. This is about talking about what's important, what's on your mind. What's you know? It's not therapy, but it's it's just it's 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 supposed to be fun. Yeah, it's supposed to be fun because we as the 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 the, the older generation, you can't keep it if you don't give it away, and it's important for us to understand the more that we connect and reach out to other people in the business and the sport and what have you, it just makes it a great sport, makes it a great thing across it, it, the board. It's insane. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Joe Valdez. You probably know. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I was talking to him like maybe a couple hours ago, and I was on the phone with him, and, and I was saying like how it's so we, – we always talk about this, and we always talk about like the fact that it's so important to live life, right, to the best of your abilities. Wake up with a right with the right attitude. Go to sleep with the right attitude, right? And uh, and always try to do good to others, you know, mm -hmm. and for others. And uh, and and um, a, a, a lot of times people like wake up mad. They go to sleep mad, you know, and things like that. And and I'm like, why? Like that makes no sense. Like we there's people accumulate so much knowledge. Like someone like you, for example, right? This this, this whole journey that you have. And you, you've accumulated so much journey, uh, so much knowledge that one day we all going to expire, right? So, but why, why do we want to leave without sharing the knowledge, you know, and sharing those experiences, you know? And and me and Joe were talking about that, and I was like, that's why it's so important to mentor other people. You know, you said something earlier. Um, I know we didn't capture that here, but uh, uh, you know, as far as like like maybe even having like a, a little. Uh, seminar or whatever like how to utilize the the cameras you know how to how to take pictures and things like that you see that's that's what it comes down to you know why hold on to it you know like why hold on to it one day we can expire and we don't leave anything behind like we gotta leave a mark you know uh, I, I, hopefully the things that i do uh when i'm gone like hopefully someone out there can say like you know what he taught me how to do this one day you know he taught me how to do that because that 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 stays man you know, once we're gone, we're gone. Like, uh, like they'll they'll remember us for a week, and then after that, man, they you're lucky people remember you. You know, uh, unless you right to the wheels <laughs> fall off. <man. laughs> yeah, there, there you go. And and I appreciate that, man, because like every time, like I've been out there with the team, with the fighters and stuff like that. You know, you uh, you've always tried to capture moments with my fighters and I. You know, not not my fighters, but the the, the fighters that I train. 
and, and you know, and, and I like you try to capture those moments and you share those moments with me, you know, and 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 this and, and it, like when things happen without knowing that you know that that you taking the picture, you know, so just a the, the a natural moment, you know, like like there is a connection between a coach and fighter, and we come together, you know, hug whatever the the outcome is, you know, and you capturing those moments, and and I really appreciate that, you know, and that's important because. <clears throat> Like the other day, I, I went in my closet and I found photo albums. Who has photo albums, guys? Come on. Who has that stuff? <laughs> Every, Everything yeah. is, look, look, cell phone. Yeah. To the left, yeah. to the left, to the left. You know? But I, I found the photo albums in my closet and I started looking through them. And they were the rock steady crew breakdancing photos. Look at that, dude. It was like, who would think that that's history, man. That I will have photos that are 38 years old. 38 years old from a part of um, some history of, of my life. And it's, it's, it's just humbling to, 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 to still have something like that. And that's why it's important when I shoot a, a fighter fighting and, and somebody in the way and, you know, making yeah. weight and what have you, that understand that that athlete, male or female, Years down the line, their kids are going to show their kids yes. these photos. Yes. And it's, it's part of bringing that history out. So it's it's fun. It's a lot of fun. That's awesome, dude. Man, I really, truly appreciate you making time for us, coming yeah. out, sharing your story, man. I look forward to uh, talking to you again at some point. Oh, of course. You know? and, uh, and, and by all means, you know, we're here for you. For the community you know and and i really i'm grateful to to have met you and have you as a friend uh and Thank things like that. that and i look forward to a lot more things man you know i know we we can make more things happen you know for, for our community for ourselves you know just a, a big extended family you know okay. help each other out man thank you for sharing your story today man uh, and i look forward to having you again thank you brother appreciate you appreciate you man all right thank, thank you, you. Right. Subscribe and like our page will put you in the game. The bean bags talk. Hey, dude.